Deus Ex Human Revolution is an action role-playing game developed by Eidos Montreal, published by Square Enix and released in 2011. I played the updated Director's Cut version, released in 2013, and I played the PC release. Deus Ex Human Revolution takes place in the near future of 2027, where there have been enhancements in biotechnology and cybernetics that enhance the human body's performance. Alongside this technology, powerful global corporations have gained power and authority rivaling government. These corporations contain dangerous social and political leaders, soldiers and scientists, that conflict with each other in order to further their agenda. Society has become divided between the Augs, or humans who have accepted augmentation technology, and the normal humans who are either morally opposed to it, too poor to afford it, or whose bodies actively reject it. You play as Adam Jensen. Jensen has a criminal justice background and was an ex-cop in the Detroit Police Department. After working in the police force, Jensen was hired as a chief of security at Seraph Industries, a biotech company that researches human augmentation. He was recommended to be hired by Megan Reed, Jensen's longtime friend and ex-partner. Jensen's background and occupation fit perfectly into the gameplay and allows it to tell a compelling story. It also still leaves enough freedom to express yourself through the player's own actions and words during the events of the game. The game's intro is perfectly crafted as it introduces you to Seraph Industries and its mix of science and corporate influence in its products and research. It shows you the impact augmentation has on the world as you get exposure to biotechnology and the research that takes place within the labs, as well as introducing Jensen's personal and primary motivations as during the intro, Seraph Industries is attacked by heavily armed soldiers resulting in Jensen taking severe, almost fatal damage and resulting in Megan Reed's death. Jensen immediately goes under augmentation implant surgery in order to survive the attack. This intro shows both the positive nature of augmentations in their ability to improve and save lives, and also the negative nature in their ability to hurt and take lives during this attack on Seraph Industries. Jensen didn't have a choice to get augmentations, putting him in a unique position. In a world with a large spectrum of views surrounding augmentation, Jensen is now in the center of the discussion and has a complex relationship between himself and the rest of society. This unique dynamic is explored throughout the game, putting him in the receiving end of oppression and judgment. The boss soldiers that attacked Jensen in the intro are reoccurring characters and were the weakest part of the game, story and character wise. While they are pretty one dimensional throughout the events of the game, I like their inclusion here in the opening sequence. It shows you the difference in strength in their augmentations and it explains the clear threat augmentations can pose. Jensen now has first hand experience almost losing his life to them while also having augmentation surgery that saves Jensen's life after the attack. The encounter with the boss soldiers gives you things to look forward to as you'll get a chance at revenge story-wise, you'll have growth in your abilities to strive for gameplay-wise, and have a feeling of progression once they're finally taken down. I found the world, social climate, and setting to be extremely intriguing. The idea of social division in technology, and more specifically biotechnology, can go in many interesting directions, and Deus Ex explores a lot of them. Deus Ex Human Revolution had interesting and complex characters with solid designs that left a memorable impression. These characters step forward to lead people with many different strong ideals. Deus Ex asks questions like, what makes a human human? Does biotechnology make them less than or more than human? Even those who hold or oppose the same values try to achieve their goals in drastically different ways. Some who are for augmentation want to use it to better our lives by improving our performance, while others want to use augmentation for military and combat purposes. Problems with augmentation exist like augmentation rejection, when the body rejects an augmentation, augmentation psychosis, a loss of control or a loss of humanity due to augmentation, or neuropathy dependence. As, once you receive an augmentation, you'll have a controlled weekly dependence of the drug neuropazine in order to prevent buildup or problems after augmentation. Some who are against augmentation fight to bring attention to these problems that are swept under the rug by the health and science corporations that are profiting off of and researching augmentation. This attention to detail creates a believable world, and seeing how different factions of people justify or reject the ethics of human augmentation, and how they try to achieve their goals kept me interested in the story, along with Jensen's personal involvement, and my own involvement through my choices. The game's world building is really impressive. 
Most impressively is the way that the environments tell a story. Different sections of the cities are inhabited by different types of people. The wealth disparity is visualized as the clean and polished corporations like Seraf Industries, the police station, and the limb clinic are filled with uniformed employees that greatly contrast the bleak, run-down, trash-filled city streets that contain closed boarded-up shops, heavily police patrolled streets, and citizens crowding around trash can fires in the alleyways, slums, and sewers. Information about the game's world are found all over as you'll hear recent events on TV, radio news, and idle chatter from the citizens. You'll also read about these events in newspapers, emails, and articles during your exploration. I feel these type of audio and text logs weren't engaging to me personally, but they'll flesh out the world and add more detail in order to properly immerse yourself in the world and story is trying to tell. In the moment, it can be hard to follow all the different corporations that have influence over the game's story, but I think the characters, their actions, and the main story do a lot of the legwork to properly build this world. By having figureheads and leaders you interact with throughout the events of the game, it puts a face and a character to these conflicting motivations, groups, and ideas, making them much more memorable and easier to follow. The side missions were handled really well. They were interesting and fun to complete. They went with a less is more approach. There aren't a whole lot of side missions, but each introduced new characters and either explored events related to the main plot, or fleshed out an existing character's personality and background. The world is split into two types of areas. Main Cities and Missions Main cities are meant to be explored multiple times. These city areas give you time to manage your equipment, do side quests, and talk to people. Mission areas are more traditional and focused level challenges. This format allows the game to pace the player, while immersing them in the world in both types of areas. Missions are neatly and tightly packed. Traversal through these areas are well designed. Missions usually contain important events that move the story forward. Once you finish each mission, you'll return to the cities, allowing you to relax a bit, spend your cash, and stock up for the next mission. There's a satisfying loop gathering items and cash during missions, and coming back to the cities to make use of them. Each return trip you'll get stronger. You can buy weapons, attachments, and tools at the arms dealers. You can buy health and energy refills and augmentation upgrade points at the limb clinic. The overworld is a perfect size and is filled with pockets of places to explore. The city areas feel full, however they're missing a bit of engagement. The game is fine as it is because there's plenty to do visiting shops, doing side quests, and just exploring and taking in the locations. However, there isn't anything beyond that. I think adding small side activities outside of the main sneaking and killing gameplay would add further optional chances to slow down the pace of the game and further immerse me in this world as opposed to solely immersing me in Jensen's job. The game excels at having a variety of mechanics that allow you to play the way you want by using speech, stealth, hacking, action combat, or a mix between them. You're given a direct choice with your actions throughout the game, and it allows for a deep sense of immersion. Areas are designed with this multi-level approach as well. Vents, walls, and barriers allow Jensen to quietly maneuver through the areas. Hacking allows you to open new pathways, disable security, and gather passcodes and intel by reading emails and other important notes. If that's not your style, those same walls and barriers can be broken down or used as cover for intense direct firefights. Just as the levels allow for different playstyles and approaches, so does the wide variety of weapons, tools, equipment, and abilities. These items will vary to strengthen your stealth or direct playstyles or allow for more flexibility when things don't go as planned, allowing you to swap playstyles on the fly depending on what you brought with you. I was impressed with just how many weapons and items are in the game. There's something for every occasion rewarding a prepared player. Non-lethal weapons like stun guns, tranquilizer rifles can be used to silently take down opponents, while combat rifles, shotguns, and grenade launchers are there when you need to storm through an area. On top of that, weapons can be further modified and upgraded with attachments to further customize your loadout. You can buy things like a silencer for less noise, armor piercing for more consistent damage, and a laser sight to help your aim. You'll have access to tools like the automatic unlocking device for auto hacking, cyber boost items to refill your battery for takedown and abilities, and hypo stim, which can heal and temporarily increase your max health. 
Areas are filled with these helpful items that can be found and looted, rewarding exploration. Your inventory space can be upgraded, but is still limited, which I really liked. The small inventory space makes you carefully consider what to bring with you, and makes scavenging in each area important. You'll have a bigger incentive to try new weapons, as you'll find ammo is also limited. You'll be conditioned to swap to whatever weapon is best for the job, while also trying out new weapons found in each area. The upgrade augmentations Jensen can unlock are simple, but they get the job done. Objectively, I don't think there's a problem with the upgrades available, but I personally wanted more fun abilities to play around with. Instead, it just made inconvenient mechanics less inconvenient. I felt like my upgrade points were gone before I knew it, and it didn't really go toward anything fun or rewarding. For example, you start with an empty radar, barely any running stamina, a single slow to recharge battery, and a small carrying capacity. Upgrading certain augmentations adds map features other games would provide from the start, like a vision cone, sound display, and markers. I found about one-fifth of the upgrades to be interesting and enjoyable to use. A few abilities I enjoyed were the ability to see through walls, turn invisible, a short range explosion, and hacking to take control of turrets, robots, and cameras. The vast majority of points got sucked into hacking ranks, hacking modifications, and battery enhancements. Other upgrades I was uninterested included a stealth timer, aim stabilizer, a higher jump, and silenced footsteps. I want to be clear, my complaints with the type of augmentations that are unlocked are my own personal complaint. This game's world is very cleverly designed around the abilities you unlock, and the subtle harmony of the two aspects results in really strong level design. For example, lung filters are unlocked the same time as the longer sprinting, and can allow you passage through areas with toxic gas. Strength upgrades let you pick up heavier objects so you can open up new paths, and you can throw those objects as weapons during combat. Upgrading your hacking rank will unlock new pathways and information. Upgrades do in fact change how you travel and approach combat encounters. As a result of the more reserved upgrade system, the world can be more deeply catered to and balanced around upgrades. I noticed and appreciated how each upgrade opened up the map, and depending on which augmentations you choose, you'll open up different paths. Upgrades are like keys that open up new areas and all feed or funnel back into each other. The gunplay feels good, Jensen's very fragile and you can be overwhelmed very easily, forcing you to carefully think about every encounter. You are rewarded for strategic play. The cover-based shooting works well. Cover and abilities allow you to maneuver around fights and plan your attacks. There's a small variety of enemies in the game, most of which are soldiers. They have a slight variation in weapon loadouts, but they all behave the same. Given the structure of the game, this is fine. The variation comes in the level design and how you approach each encounter. That being said, there are other enemies and obstacles like robots, turrets, mines, cameras, and bosses that spice up the gameplay more. Boss fights were challenging and clever, reinforcing that idea that your approach to fights is what's important. Multiple strategies work that result in different outcomes, strengthening the ability to play how you want. A pure stealth playstyle feels really slow. Not only is the moment to moment stealth gameplay slow, and the consequence of being spotted a big punishment, but you need to pour a lot of points into your abilities before you have the proper tools to get around in stealth effectively. When close to an enemy, you're able to perform non-lethal or lethal takedowns, but this also drains the battery resource. You'll start out with one battery that's very slow to recharge, so you'll need to spend more points and choose whether you want abilities and no battery power to use them, or if you want access to more batteries and a faster recharge just for taking down enemies. While I do believe this slow start can hurt the stealth elements of the game, it's not to say that there isn't a solution found in the inventory system. You can find cyber boost bars that recharge your batteries instantly. This reinforces that strong design of the limited inventory I talked about earlier, and provides more inventory management and priority to bring what's important to you. Also, as mentioned before, you have the ability to change your strategy on the fly with items and clever use of the environments. They'll provide more options to those who are willing to abandon a pure stealth playthrough. I admire the attempt to make the hacking minigame fun, but it's not. Hacking is useful and results in its ability to open up new pathways, 
and later has the potential to be helpful when hacking turrets, cameras, and robots. The hacking minigame itself just felt tedious and easy. There's a lot of unnecessary hacking abilities, with so many stages of hacking and hacking defense upgrades you can just pour points into. The hacking upgrades just make the easy hacking even easier, plus the addition of consumable items like the automatic unlocking device that allows you to hack anything regardless of your hacking level, nuke virus software and stop worm software that take nodes undetected and freeze the countdown for 5 seconds, making the hacking a breeze. The only thing worth putting points into for hacking is capture. It lets you hack higher level systems. You won't be able to attempt hacking of devices above your hacking rank. It's really unsatisfying finding hacking devices just to open it up and be locked out of it because your rank's too low. When hacking is introduced into a game, it's usually repeated many times. This repetition means you have to be really careful in how the process is designed. Hacking needs to be fun for the first time, but also needs to be fun the hundredth time. And Deus Ex's hacking gets tedious and repetitive. For me, a good example of hacking is Bioshock 2. It's simple, fast, and just one press of the button with the right timing will progress you through it. Making an action that's repeated hundreds of times painless and doesn't pull me out of the action for too long. There are moments in Deus Ex Human Revolution where you debate with important people and depending on how you interact with them, it can impact how you'll be able to complete your mission going forward. Despite these moments able to be boiled down to just selecting one of three options, I found myself constantly engaged in these moments due to the context of the story and interactions. You're rewarded for carefully listening to the character's choice of words, and can even read their facial expressions to figure out if your approach is working. I wish I could be more productive in my criticism of the upgrade system, as you can make a lot of changes. The important part, and the hard part, would be making changes while keeping that strong relationship between the upgrades and opening up the world. Mostly I'd like to see a better balance with the early game battery systems. Right now the amount of battery you have access to versus the demand is skewed heavily toward the demand. Takedowns consume your one battery, and certain augmentations will consume battery life. So you're off to such a slow start choosing between batteries and no upgrades, or upgrades and no batteries to use them with. It becomes less of a problem after you get over that upgrade hump, and after you start to manage your inventory with battery recharge consumables. I'd like to see a more streamlined hacking tree and maybe a reworked and rebalanced hacking minigame. So many points go into hacking that are unnecessary and better off ignored. A total of 13 points can be put into hacking, but I made it through my playthrough without any hacking issues just by putting 5 points into capture 1 through 5, just to make sure I could hack any terminal. A lot of the augmentations are just simple stat enhancements like the aim stabilizer, more HUD elements, sprinting longer, more armor, and more carrying capacity. I'd like to see less flat stat enhancements and more active abilities. I had the most fun with the augmentations when I had the action abilities like stealth, seeing through walls, and a short range explosion. Lastly, you can upgrade Jensen so that he doesn't take fall damage. There's a really nice cutscene fall animation that looks really cool, and I'm sure some people are really proud of it, but it takes a really long time. They could have just done something that doesn't interrupt the action or movement, like a first person animation of Jensen landing harder, his fist hitting the ground for a short moment, with dust particles being pushed up around him. The first time I played this game was the original release on the Xbox 360, and this game contains long load times. So when I picked it up again on PC for this video, the first thing I did was install it on my SSD. That helped shorten the traditional loading screens. However, there are loading screens hidden during elevator rides, computer scans, and opening doors that are hard-baked into the game, and are unaffected by running the game on better hardware. I understand that for the time of this game's release, these load times were a necessity, but after playing the original when it came out, and playing it on modern PC hardware, there's so much downtime in the game that it really started to bother me. I lost count of just how many elevators are in this game, and it got so bad in some of the later sections. Not to mention the unexpected deaths or bad saves that'll happen, adding more load times. Load times became a serious complaint for me and my enjoyment of the game. This is the kind of game where it's advised to alternate on multiple save files in case of a bad autosave. The game conveniently features a quick load option for the most recent autosave and the previous autosave before that. 
Being able to quick load an autosave that isn't the most recent is something that comes in handy more than you'd think, and it's a really nice quality of life addition. Deus Ex Human Revolution uses a strong yellow color palette through the entire game. I think the clean and consistent use of this visual theme in the menus and the environments sells that near futuristic feel the game's going for, and makes other colors and details stand out that much more. Each area keeps the near futuristic themes, but each has its own distinct feel and its own attention to detail that make locations stand out from one another. The original release included a yellow tint layered over top of the game that was removed in the director's cut version of the game. I think the yellow tint in the original was a bit too much. The tint doesn't allow other colors to breathe, muddies details, and changes the atmosphere of locations that are going for a different feel or mood. Adam Jensen has a solid and iconic design, both with and without the trench coat, even if I don't know where the sunglasses go when they retract. His sleek, all-black design makes him feel right at home in this futuristic world. Jensen's character is expressed in his design. When he's in public, he wears the black trench coat that hides most of his augmentations. Alternatively, during missions, he wears a black vest that exposes his augmented arms. The other main characters, in combination with their values, have surprisingly memorable designs. Even if most of them weren't visually unique, the time you spent interacting with each character provided a sense of familiarity in a way that left an impression. My only problem with the characters are that during conversations, the model's animations felt too rigid. The movements were abrupt and jarring. Due to how long the movement animations can be, it's also really clear when they're reused. The soundtrack was composed by Michael McCain. McCain composed an amazing, unique, and memorable soundtrack for Deus Ex Human Revolution. It's really good. The soundtrack uses a mixture of jazz, techno synth, and classically influenced ambient tracks. The songs capture the emotions and impact perfectly. They feel melancholic, but grand to reflect the divided state of society. Songs will ramp up and become faster to match the more action-heavy combat sequences. The music also changes to include the other countries and other locations' influences that you'll travel to. The voice acting was really consistent, dialogue was expressive. Jensen's voice actor doesn't really show range. I don't necessarily think this is a problem since his character is serious. Jensen's expressions and intent show through, but there isn't a lot of emotion in his delivery. There was one voice line repeated by an NPC when your gun is drawn, that sounded noticeably more quiet and muffled compared to the other recorded lines, though this is the only line in the game I found with a problem like that. For a game that has you spending time with characters that have such interesting and diverse opinions and backgrounds, and for a game that lets you approach these situations in different ways, the endings don't offer much of a resolution or epilogue for these characters and world. Without any spoilers, you make a big important decision in the last seconds of the game by pushing one of four big red buttons. Then you're just shown how the world has changed as a result of your choice and the game ends. I felt no closure. These endings lack the nuance that the characters themselves expressed, and I don't feel connected to any of the endings. Not to mention the last save can always be reloaded in order to view the other outcomes, removing more weight of a concise and solid ending. The original release of Deus Ex Human Revolution was in 2011. In 2013, a director's cut version of the game was released that more naturally integrated the DLC into the base game's story. It overhauled boss battle levels, now enabling players with stealth builds to have an easier way to kill bosses. Jensen will be able to regenerate two energy cells on all but the hardest difficulty, and it added New Game Plus and removed the yellow visual filter. These changes make the director's cut the preferred and recommended way to play this game. Deus Ex Human Revolution is a polished and fun action role-playing game. It shines in its interesting premise and variety of characters with interesting and diverse values. These strong character designs make the sometimes hard to follow plot easier to digest. Gameplay is fun and varied as you can approach it with a variety of playstyles, choices, and abilities, while still leaving room to change your approach at any time. Though most of the augmentations may feel bland, the way they're implemented in the strong level design makes for a very engaging moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. It's shown its age due to its plentiful amount of load times, but for those who are patient with both the story and gameplay, you'll find a great, well-paced, immersive experience.
Thanks for watching the video. If you want to see more like it, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. I also stream on Twitch at twitch.tv slash ryanbeardy. Follow me on Twitter at ryanbeardy, and I have a Discord with the link below.